Good afternoon. My name is Melissa Dietrich, Associate Director of Membership, and I'd like to welcome you to the Meadow Garden, a living landscape. It is my pleasure to introduce you to our presenter, Leah Johnson, PhD, Associate Director of Land Stewardship and Ecology. Leah combines scientific research in ecological plant and research in plant ecology and ecological restoration with land management. She directs a multidisciplinary team that integrates ecology, plant science, landscape architecture, wildlife biology, and horticulture to stewardship of 750 acres of diverse habitats in a dynamic and urbanized landscape. Under her direction, the Land Stewardship and Ecology Program conducts long-term ecological research in forests, wetlands, riparian corridors, meadows, and agriculture lands, as well as develops and tests best practices in landscape in land stewardship. And she managed, and they manage more than 100 acres of public facing native meadows and forests, highlighting the beauty and value of native plants. Today's recorded presentation and resource information will be emailed to all attendees. At the end of the session, Leah can answer your questions. Please submit them, submit them in the question section. Leah, thank you for being with us today to share your expertise. Thank you, Melissa, and thank you everyone for being here. So as Melissa mentioned, um, I lead the Land Stewardship and Ecology Program here at Longwood Gardens, where we conduct ecological research supporting our adaptive land management. Um, we develop, test, and communicate innovative land stewardship practices, engage in education and engagement, like what we're doing today. Um, and we coordinate and collaborate to address large scale challenges. Uh, I do not do this by myself. I have a wonderful team of people here at Longwood, uh, including my awesome staff and our many wonderful students and volunteers who help us accomplish all of this work. Um, many people are not aware that Longwood Gardens um, proper uh, is at the heart of uh, more than a thousand acres of land, uh, about two thirds of which is in natural areas of different kinds. Uh, we have about an equal amount of forest and meadow, over 200 acres of each. Uh, we have reforestation plantings, we have streams and wetlands, and agricultural fields as well. So today's uh, topic is the meadow garden, and I think it's probably good to start with, uh, when we're thinking about what is a meadow garden, to think about what is a meadow to start with. Um, a meadow is essentially a full sun plant community. Uh, it's dominated by grass-like or graminoid species, so grasses and sedges and rushes. Um, and flowering herbs. Um, and it can be managed for hay production. When people talk about meadows, they often mean hay fields. And um, a, an important thing to understand about meadows is that they are a plant community that, that uh, exists sort of early in the process of ecological succession, uh, which is a concept a lot of people have heard of. But the basic idea is that after um, some kind of ecological disturbance that gradually plants grow on a site and over time, depending on where you are on the planet, a, a different uh, sort of uh, plant community will form over time. Um, this is also called vegetation dynamics. Um, if it, people used to think that, um, that these plant communities sort of uh, developed like an organism, that they started, you know, with a sort of embryonic phase and that they would always reach the same endpoint. And we now know that that's not true, that species sort of come in and out in a more individual way. Um, but this, the, the process of change in the composition and structure of these communities over time is something that um, has to do with the changing conditions that plants create um, throughout that process. So Ecological succession or vegetation dynamics essentially begin with some kind of ecological disturbance. And that might be something that is very patchy, like a fire. 
Um, or it could be something enormous that sets, sets the whole situation back to mineral soil, like a volcanic eruption or uh, deposition of a huge sand dune or um, uh, the debris of a glacier or um, spoils from mining. Ecological disturbance can also be um, something that is periodic, like the flooding of a river in spring um, or a wetland. And ecological disturbances are also created by people. Um, we do all kinds of things to landscapes to, um, to shape them in ways that we find helpful to us. In the mid-Atlantic region of the United States, um, people have been studying the process of ecological succession. And one of the longer um, ecological su succession studies that exists anywhere um, at Rutgers University. And they, they've been, it's a really interesting study where they've been looking at how, um, when fields are let go, what happens afterwards? And um, by letting, basically by stopping to plow uh, different fields at different times um, over decades. And the basic pattern in this part of the world, after you stop plowing a field, um, is that in the beginning, it's dominated by annual plants. Um, over time, perennials, like goldenrods, um, start to take up more space because they're able to hold that space through the winter um, and start off bigger in the spring. Um, after uh, a number of years in that situation, you start to get um, tree species and shrub species starting to compete uh, with those uh, annual herbaceous plants and the perennial herbaceous plants. And they eventually, over time, shade out those sun-loving plants uh, grow taller than them, basically. Um, trees win where it's wet enough and moist enough and there's enough soil for trees to win. Um, so if you want to have a meadow and you want to keep it a meadow, you have to stop this process and you have to set the clock back um, at least a little bit uh, so that you can continue to have space for those sun-loving plants. And meadows have become increasingly rare um, in the region uh, with the uh, abandonment of, of, and transformation of, of agricultural areas into other land uses. So uh, meadows and, and in this uh, point in time, although they were much more abundant during the um, more heavy agricultural um, period in the Eastern United States, um, have now become a, a place that is uh, sort of a refuge for, um, for meadow species. Uh, naturally occurring meadows require some kind of ecological disturbance, and that could be um, something like uh, in, in the eastern U.S. that might be very large windstorms or one of the one of the sources of that as well as periodic fire. Um, the, these are often ephemeral or short short term short lived landscapes. Um, and they occur as patches often, and they also can persist in places with extreme conditions. So uh, places with very dry soils, um, or in which often lead to frequent fire, um, high altitude environments, uh, places where it's very cold, um, like up a tree line in a, in a high alpine situation, um, frequently flooded places, um, and places with really unusual soils, like unusual um, soil chemistry, like a serpentine marin, or extremely rocky uh, locations. So we've talked about what a meadow is. So then what is a meadow garden? Um, I think of a meadow garden as a, as a meadow that is tended for both biodiversity and beauty. Um, and it's a place where ecology intersects with and interacts with horticulture and landscape design, which I think is a very exciting place for things to meet. Um, the history of meadow gardens is like the top subject of a whole other <laughs> talk maybe, but um, there you could go back to the landscape, um, landscape gardening movement in England in the 18th century. Um, in more recent time, there have been a number of influential designers and um, plant uh, developers and nursery people who have led uh, the, the interest in using uh, native plants and using meadow plants as well. Um, and there's an interesting interplay between Europe and the US and there was popularization of North American meadow plants in Europe that is part of this whole conversation. Um, and there, there are a number of um, thinkers who have led this sort of um, increasing aesthetic appreciation of uh, meadows as a, as a landscape design form. So Longwood's Meadow Garden um, 
has an interesting history. Um, it's, part, it's, it's part of a living landscape that has been shaped over time. It reflects relationships between people and nature over that time. In the 40s, the landscape surrounding Longwood Gardens was primarily agricultural, and up to that point, um, following the European colonization process and the transformation of the previous forest, uh, it was covered in agricultural land. Um, and you can see sort of, I don't know if my pointer would be obvious, um, perhaps. Uh, up in this area here is where the, the meadow garden is now, kind of in the center top of the picture. Um, and you can see that there are uh, remnants of forest, um, including what is now our forest walk. In the 60s, the area that is now the meadow garden uh, was a mixture of crop fields, um, hay fields, uh, some, it was previously all pasture. Um, so you can see from this photo that uh, it's not especially diverse in plants, um, although if you probably, if you looked at it really closely, you would probably find some diversity, but it's dominated by uh, European cool season grasses, which are good for um, cow forage. Um, in uh, 1969, uh, there was a shift in how uh, the meadow was managed and in the, um, from that point through the, uh, the mid 70s, this, this new idea took shape of the, the naturalized meadow um, where um, people introduced uh, native wildflowers for the most part um, and other herbaceous plants into the meadow um, and began managing it differently rather than um, it, it, mowing it less frequently. Um, in 1989, uh, buffer plantings began up along the northern part of the meadow, which is the thing that looks a bit like a snake coming in from the left. Um, if you're in the meadow garden today, you would see this wall of trees along the northern edge, and that was, uh, that was a massive planting project um, that happened in 89. And the biggest transformation in the creation of what we know now as the meadow garden um, it began with the Route 52, uh, moving of Route 52, uh, and the ecological landscape restoration that went along with that project. There were a number of guiding concepts that were um, developed to, um, to guide the creation of the Meadow Garden. The first of those is, the, is history, the history of the land, the historical evolution of the land, and the unique character of the Brandywine region. And beauty is really, you know, at the heart of what Longwood does. <laughs> so it's not surprising that beauty is an essential element of the, the meadow garden. And this is a, a slightly different kind of beauty. You know, this is the, the beauty of, a, of an intricately synchronized ecosystem of the interwoven tapestry of life. Um, Aldo Leopold wrote that our ability to perceive quality in nature begins as in art with the pretty and it expands through successive stages of the beautiful to values, I love how he puts this, as, as yet uncaptured by language. Um, it is not hard for most people to recognize that this goldfinch is a beautiful bird, and you can find the goldfinches in the meadow garden. Um, birds like, the, like the, uh, the goldfinch are not quite as pretty when they're young, um, but, there is, <laughs> but, but, but the, the young goldfinch is essential to the adult. Um, and when you uh, understand that the goldfinch is part of um, an ecosystem that requires um, the production of the seeds that it eats, like the thistles that it loves in the meadow garden, um, and that this messy looking bundle of stuff is where it raises its young, um, this becomes beautiful too. So there, there's, there are layers to the, to the beauty of the, of the meadow garden and of ecosystems more broadly. Um, the beauty of the meadow garden is also um, is also engaged with variety. There, there's an element of surprise. Um, you really can't walk through the meadow twice and have the same experience. And another part of that variety is biodiversity. Biodiversity really creates that um, that experience of variety. So. Um, we're building structure and resilience in, that, in natural communities, encouraging biodiversity um, from a supporting biodiversity uh, of animals and insects using plants because plants are the foundation of biodiversity. 
So we, you know, we have created a, a haven for native plant and pollinator species and a regionally important oasis for migratory birds and other native wildlife. Another uh, key element of the, of the meadow garden is stewardship. So maximizing biodiversity for long-term resilience. Um, and this is, uh, this is essential, right? You can't have a long-term meadow garden without stewardship. All of these things combine uh, to hopefully inspire the people who uh, enjoy the meadow garden uh, with its, uh, you know, many, many facets, um, its different expression, expressions of nature's variety, um, and the careful stewardship that tends it over time, which we hope is often invisible. Um, I frequently get the, the, uh, the comment when people learn a little bit about what we do that um, it's surprising that it takes work to make things look natural, but uh, we're in a, a changing world. So uh, all of these ideas came together to create the design for the Meadow Garden. Um, Jonathan Alderson, a, a, a local landscape architect, worked with us on this. Um, and the, these concepts, uh, the guiding concepts are infused through the design. So from the selection of and placement of the plants in the entrance, um, to conservation of, uh, of a, a rarer, more coastal plain grassland species that lives in the, in the meadow, um, Anthropogon gyrans, to um, adding diversity to the, um, to the meadow and thinking as, uh, as part of that process about how that affects the experience of color through the season. The pathways in the meadow garden um, are not all visible from one spot unless you're up in the air. Um, so you know they they take you through a, a variety of habitats. Um, they wind you through the space. Structural elements invite you into the middle of things um, and provide um, informational and rest experiences um, at various points um, across the garden. The interpretive Pavilions bring out different elements of the meadow garden and their experience with some wonderful art. And the farmhouse gallery um, illustrates the history of the land. A, a whole design was made also for the trails and the wayfinding. Um, this, they, you know, these signs are posted throughout the, um, throughout the meadow garden to help people find their way. And we also have more flexible interpretation that we use um, these these uh, sort of chalkboard signs with a with a marking pen, so that we can you know highlight different things as uh, as things change through the seasons. So to create the meadow garden um, involved taking a uh, hay field uh, with very low species diversity of non-native grasses and replacing that, um, as well as. Um, the, the, the terraforming that went on as part of the Route 52 project. So the landform actually changed in some areas because of the road being built. So that uh, reshaping of the landscaping and, uh, and then drill seeding with native seed. Um, a cool piece of technology <laughs> that was used for this is a, a Truex drill seeder, which mixes up the seeds um, of native plants while it's, while it's seeding, which is really important because otherwise the tiny little seeds all go, go out first and then the big seeds go out last um, and you would get like stripes of plants uh, rather than a, a mixture um, of things so that plants can you know, basically figure out where, where they're going to do best across the landscape. Um, in addition to seeding um, over the course of the initial establishment and then refinement of that, uh, about 170,000 plugs um, uh, were installed to both uh, highlight, um, you know, with, with color, different species in different places, and also uh, to increase diversity. There are some plugs getting uh, ready to go in the ground. Um, and this is just the first year. Rebecca um, comes up really well often in the first uh, first couple of years after after seeding a brand new meadow. Um, and we found recently when we were um, doing some management, uh, we had some invasive plants and we removed those, and we found that the Rebecca came right back up. Um, you know several years later. So um, part of what creates the meadow over time um, and renews the meadow over time with disturbance is 
uh, is that seed bank that grows um, as the meadow moves through, uh, moves through time, leaving seeds behind. So these are uh, examples of plug plantings where uh, we sort of planted wedges of, uh, of, of plugs into, um, into other vegetation, inviting the eye uh, with color. In 2014, uh, the Meadow Garden had expanded from 45 acres to 86. Um, two and a half plus walking trail miles had been added um, of that 1,500 feet of boardwalk, um, 51 acres of seeded meadow, 115 that ended up being larger um, later on in the, in the installation of plugs. Um, many also container perennials and trees and shrubs were part of the, the creation of the, the, the visual softening of, of the edge of the meadow as well. You can see those flowering beautifully in the springtime. Um, so once you have a meadow garden, um, if you want to keep it a meadow garden, you have to maintain it because of that need for, um, for ecological disturbance. So you have to stop the process of ecological succession, turn back the clock a little bit. Um, somewhere in this period, you know, any between the like maybe the second, third, fourth, fifth pictures, it, you can. Um, depending on your management objectives, um, you could let it go longer or you could um, disturb it more frequently. And also the plants you're trying to encourage. Um, so at Longwood, we are fortunate to be able to use prescribed fire. Um, we, we generally disturb about one third of the meadow garden every spring um, or every year. And uh, the, what is totally amazing about uh, prescribed fire and the way that meadows respond is that plants, uh, meadow plants are adapted to this kind of disturbance. This is just a couple of weeks after a burn. Um, they sprout right back up. Many of them are perennial. Um, and so they come back up from the roots and then others, um, the, the fire creates a good germination uh, situation for them and they're able to germinate and, and grow immediately after the fire. Uh, we also use mowing. Um, not everywhere uh, should be burned for various reasons. And you know, if, if you um, are thinking about uh, creating a home meadow, uh, you might not want to use prescribed fire. It's a little complicated to do, um, but but you might uh, but you might want to use mowing. It's a very commonly used technique for uh, for meadow management. And again, we you know disturb about a third of the of the meadow garden with any given technique in a given year. Um, so, of course, <laughs> like in any garden, there is weeding. I know that um, sometimes people are attracted to uh, meadow garden uh, as, a, as the idea that they might not have to ever weed again, um, which you can do if you don't mind some of the stuff that comes in. Um, but there are plants that, that will take over. And so, you know, we, we do things like, you know, we have to remove things like Canada thistle. Um, but there, you know, there are, uh, the, in general, the, the input of time is less than in other, other types of gardens that are more tightly controlled. Um, home meadow gardening is something a lot of people are interested in. I find this very exciting. Um, I think there are a lot of applications of um, <clears throat> meadow gardening and use of native uh, sun-loving plants in the home environment. So this is a way to bring biodiversity home. Um, to support native meadow plants and pollinators right in your yard. And it's a way to minimize your lawn area and your mowing um, and also your energy use associated with those and use of other products. Um, it's also a way to maximize support for biodiversity and um, it also uh, really adds an element of surprise throughout the season. So you, you, um, more wild systems um, are just full of surprises, uh, which is something I really love. And then the texture of meadows can be really interesting right through the winter as well. And you can select your plants for that also. Um, meadows can happen on a lot of different scales. You can use meadow plants in, um, in, as landscape accents or in sidewalk strips. Uh, this is a, a one that I found in Portland, Oregon last summer. Um, pots and containers, window boxes, you can really use meadow plants in a lot of different contexts, um, as long as you've got sun. Um, the meadow plants generally do not like shade. So 
you can do meadow gardening just about anywhere. Most, uh, many, many places have, have, a, have native meadow types uh, or grassland types. And so, and, and also, you know, thinking in a North American context, many species have very large ranges. Many meadow species are, are found across much of the country. Um, so they might be nat native in meadows across large areas of the country as well, which helps for being able to find plant material. Um, some favorites that people enjoy, um, the Rudbeckia that I was talking about, there are other uh, Rudbeckia species in addition to Herta. Um, uh, Indian grass or gastrum nutans, uh, echinacea species, a uh, little blue stem, uh, the mountain mints, there are also a few different ones of those. Um, cardinal flower, these are all um, showy, they have different attributes that are, you know, some are good for pollinators, um, some add texture. Um, these are some very popular plants. There are uh, a bunch of online resources in the uh, in the resource guide that, that we made for this uh, for this talk. And those basically are um, a, a collection of um, how to get started kind of resources and then how to source plants. Um, some of my favorite things in this uh, in this list include uh, the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center's plant finder tool and their plant list. Those are really great. Um, if you haven't explored that website, there's a lot of good stuff in there. Um, you can find lots of information about native species. Um, and then there are other guides here to finding, you know, just how do, how do we begin? So with that, I'm happy to answer your questions. Thank you, Leah. That was great. So we do have a number of questions. Okay. First one is from Mike. And it's about mountain balding. Is it natural or is this a created um, view shed or experience? What was the mountain balding? Mountain balding. So the clearing of, of mountaintops, were they cleared or is it a natural process? Well, I would imagine that both things occur, but definitely there are uh, mountaintops that are in very short uh, vegetation because that is the uh, basically what can survive all of the snow. Um, trees don't do very well uh, in in very uh, very cold, very snowy situations. So you often find um, alpine meadows at, at high elevation that are just created by the uh, the slow uh, process of soil formation under those conditions. So it's very rocky, not great for trees. Um, and then uh, the the very cold winter and harsh harsh winds that keep uh, keep trees from growing. Great. We have a question from David. He asked about the old Route 52. So when that was moved in the, creating the new meadow garden, was the road, re, the, the asphalt actually removed or was it just allowed for the vegetation to grow over it? Um, it was removed, yes. Um, the, what, what the vegetation is growing on now is, uh, is on soil. <laughs> Thank you. We have a question from Craig. Is there any active management of beneficial insects in the meadow garden outside? Active management of beneficial insects. Um, we, uh, our, our integrated pest management uh, group at Longwood is doing some creative things. They're participating in, um, in uh, trials for, um, for, uh, predator of emerald ash borer. So things that are focused on uh, major insect pests. Um, we, uh, in terms of ben other beneficial insects, we are intentionally creating a giant buffet for pollinators. I mean, <laughs> so not only are we providing floral resources in that, that the, the design to, to, uh, to have uh, as much floral abundance across the entire season also means nectar abundance for, for insects um, and insect diversity. Um, we have a number of species that are great for butterflies. If you're coming in the meadow entrance uh, in the kind of earlier part of the summer, uh, the um, bottle brush buckeye is just a butterfly party. Um, there are, um, 
things that we do with the Meadow Garden, part, you know, part of our only disturbing about a third of it every year is that we wanna make sure that we have plenty of, uh, of space for overwintering insects. And many of those live in hollow stems over the winter. Um, so leaving those stems standing through the winter is another technique that we use. So yes, we're, we're, we, we like insect diversity. We're trying to mm -hmm. improve it. We have a question from Valerie. Um, asking about the effects of climate change in, and what you're seeing in the meadow garden here at Longwood. So we're collecting data. Um, I, I have not uh, yet had a chance to do a detailed analysis, but we do have a, a really wonderful volunteer team called the Meadow Bloom Team, and they go out every Wednesday and they look at what is blooming in the meadow garden and when. Uh, throughout the seasons. And, you know, there, there is variability from year to year. Um, you know, in general, we're seeing a little bit longer growing season in our region. We're generally seeing a little bit warmer and wetter temperatures. Um, a question from Mike about a meadow. Should it be mowed for control in the spring or is it best in the fall? Uh, this depends on your management objectives. And here I would say for, for very specific management, um, I would recommend those guides that I put in the resource, uh, in, in the resource list because um, you, it, it depends a bit on what you want. Um, so we generally do our prescribed burning in the spring. Um, that's a good time for it right after the snows. Um, it's easier to control. It's not too dry out. Um, we like to keep it nice, <laughs> nice and contained, very controlled. Um, if you're mowing, um, uh, the, the Xerces Society for Invertebrate Conservation really recommends winter mowing. Um, you know, and again, not, not mowing everything every year. So, you know, to doing a rotation through different sections uh, of, of your meadow um, so that you leave some standing. Wonderful. Peter had a question about sunflowers particularly very large sunflowers. Are they perennial? And if so, would you have a suggestion for, for one? Um, it depends on the species, whether or not they're perennial. Many of them are though. Um, and we have, I, I particularly enjoy our ridiculously large sylphium perfoliatum, which is, you know, like 12 feet tall. Um, it has, it's called cup plant because the leaves, um, are fused at the at the stem, and water collects there. Um, but they they're just enormous and jubilant. <laughs> One of my favorites. Wonderful. Caroline asked about what is the difference between a meadow and a prairie. Oh, that's a great another good question, right? What is a meadow? What's a prairie? What's a grassland? Um, these words do get used somewhat interchangeably. Um, there are different kinds of prairie. Um, many of the species in the meadow garden are tall grass prairie, prairie plants, um, and there, you know, there there is uh, historic evidence that um, that grasslands related to the to the you know sort of central tall grass prairies did used to extend into Pennsylvania more. Um, so we use many species from that uh, from that sort of ecological palette. Um, I am originally from New Mexico, where short grass prairie, with a whole different species composition, is, is the prairie that is, that is dominant there. Um, meadows are often wetter, you know, so, so you know, you might find them, uh, it, it just depends on sort of who's talking, <laughs> but prairies can have very specific definitions. Um, so, you know, depending on the type of prairie, it tends to be more of like a, a defined community and meadow tends to be used a little bit more loosely. Uh, Leah, you mentioned that the resource guide, the resource information, that will be actually sent to all attendees as well as this recording. So you can rewatch it and review the information that you have uh, curated for us. Uh, another question, what, um, what are the common, most common plants that you have to weed out of the meadow? Ah, uh, yes, the weeding. Um... So a meadow, as this sort of open, early successional habitat tends to be, you know, like we were talking about in succession, there are annuals, there are perennials. Most of the species that show up early in succession are dispersed either by wind or by birds, which is how they travel to many different places. 
Um, there is definitely overlap between uh, the uh, physiological characteristics uh, and the sort of ecological traits of weeds and meadow plants. <laughs> so it is an environment in which species that produce a lot of seed and um, and grow quickly can do well. So we definitely have a mix. Um, luckily, lots of our native plants are very good at holding space. Um, but we, uh, oh, Canada thistle is one. We have um, some bird dispersed vines like Japanese honeysuckle um, and uh, oriental bittersweet, both of them absolutely lovely vines introduced for, <laughs> for um, berries and covering things. Um, so there are, um, those are two, then some of the big ones. We get some multiflora rose, also bird dispersed. Um, those are some of the, some of the main ones. John had a question about how to start with an existing piece of, of grass or area that is grass covered. Well, the first thing that you would start to do is decide how big an area that you would want to work with. And I think it's probably good to start small. Um, and depending on the size of what you're, you're working with and how much energy and you know, investment you want to make in the initial phases, um, once you have decided that, uh, you can decide whether you want to use seed um, or if you want to use plugs. Uh, plugs are a much faster way to get big plants. Um, they, you know, they, they, a plug comes with a root system you know, that's already developed, uh, ready to grow downward, and seeds obviously have to start from scratch. So um, seed can also be a little challenging if you are not super familiar with what your native plants look like in their seedling stage. So knowing what's a weed and what you planted on purpose can actually be kind of tricky. So um, a lot of people, I think, start small and start with plugs. Um, and then you get to know those plants um, in, you know, before you move on to bigger spaces. But you can also start with a huge project. <laughs> so but you're probably going to want help if you do that. Great advice. Deborah asked, is it ecologically more advantageous advantageous to allow natural succession? In so it, yeah, I, that's a good question. Um, so I think about uh, ecological benefit at, at the landscape scale. So um, you can look at biodiversity in a bunch of different ways. And um, in, the, in the Eastern United States, there has been a great reforestation um, following the initial deforestation. Um, when land was uh, converted to various agricultural uses, um, there have been a couple of different waves of reforestation. Um, the most recent of which, well, the first, the sort of first big wave of which was when people discovered that it was easier to farm in flat places <laughs> further west, um, and lots of people moved there and did that and had less rocks um, in their in their fields. You've seen them all piled up along the edge, so you know, all those old rock fence walls. Um, the uh, the second of which was uh, sort of around the time of the Great Depression. So we have a lot of trees that are now about 100 years old that uh, that came from that second wave of reforestation. So um, we certainly need forests, absolutely. Um, meadows and uh, grassland habitats are greatly reduced from uh, what they were uh, 100 years ago. So meadows are valuable in the big picture landscape context by offering space. Um, for migratory birds that rely on seeds of, of these plants um, and, uh, and fruits of these plants and birds that, that nest uh, on the ground in grassy areas. So they, they provide a different kind of resource. So they're part of the bigger picture um, landscape scale biodiversity strategy. Beautiful. Beverly had a question about preventing Canadian thistle that's from taking over her garden. <laughs> or do we have that? <laughs> Do we see that in our meadow? We do, we do. Um, and we, you, you just kind of have to keep at it. <laughs> part of that hard work part. Yeah, you, you kind of just have to exhaust the root system. Not a question keep it, about- Keep it from setting seed if you can. <laughs> Good piece of advice. Susan asked about uh, deer management and do we keep that away from plants and flowers in our, in our meadow garden? 
Well, the, the meadow garden is part of our natural lands. Um, we don't have fences around most of our um, natural areas. We do have some uh, deer exposure, excluding deer fencing around some of our, um, our larger reforestation planting areas so that the trees can get big enough. <laughs> um, and so deer, there are definitely deer in the meadow. Um, we do manage their populations to keep them at a sustainable level so they don't eat everything. They had a question about, is it necessary to mow yearly in a small meadow garden? And I, again, there it depends on the plant community that you want. If you mow more frequently, it'll push towards grass and you know grass species. And if you mow less frequently, you'll get more um, herbaceous perennials. So depending on um, how the species that you've introduced respond to mowing and what you would like to see in your meadow, you can mow more frequently or less frequently. Um, our rotation is about every three years in the meadow garden, unless we're trying to push an area towards more grass, in which case we'll do it more often. Or if we're managing an invasive species and we mow that a lot, like Canada this little. <laughs> So it's in flux. Yeah. Denise had a question. When is the best time to plant seeds? And do you just sprinkle them or do you, or, or do you have to mix them into the soil? Is it okay for them to just lay on top of the soil? Um, it depends again on what seeds you're using. <laughs> um, but springtime is a good time for many seeds. It depends on, again, I would, I would go with, uh, you know, look at the mix that you want for your situation. Um, I, I, there's a, um, a seed company in the, in the list um, that, of resources that has a lot of really good information about seeding. In general, you do need to, to mix it into the soil a bit. I, I showed a picture of the drill seeder that we use and basically that cuts just a very tiny little V and then puts it in, flops the soil over on top of it. had a question, what is the best way to manage uh, for hay production or hay mowing that is the least detrimental to insect population? That is also a great question. I, um, I would refer for that particular question. Again, there are a bunch of different techniques. So um, I, would, I would refer to the Xerces Society, starting with an X. Uh, Society for uh, Invertebrate Conservation. They actually uh, linked in the resource document is uh, they have a whole book about that, like a, a booklet about, you know, different, and there are lots of interesting things you can do um, for um, producing hay and uh, conserving insects at the same time. So you can do things like, you know, hay in strips where you leave some and you cut some and you leave some and you cut some. Um, you can you can adjust your timing uh, to uh, to assist insects. So there are a bunch of different ways to do that. Wonderful. We also received a question about um, someone read in the New York Times recently that PA has a grant program for homeowners to to establish a meadow garden at home. By any chance, are you familiar with this or have any additional information? I am not familiar with that, but that's really exciting. I will go find out more. Well, I'll Google. <laughs> <laughs> Question. Is there milkweed in the meadow uh, for the monarch butterflies? We have a bunch of different milkweed species, actually. So we have the common milkweed um, that, you know, the one with the big purple uh, bunches of flowers. Um, we have swamp milkweed. We have butterfly milkweed. Um, and we even have a, uh, we've been working on uh, reintroducing a rare milkweed to the, to the meadow garden in a couple of special wet spots. We like milkweed. Philip had a question about um, soil types in the meadow. Um, and, and if you could share a little bit, is there a lot of ranges and pH, um, moisture retention, surface water, anything else that you can really share? So if you, um, if you stand kind of um, on the boardwalk where you can have a nice view over the meadow garden, you can see the differences in soil. It's actually very cool. Uh, we have higher and drier areas that are better drained. We do have different, uh, you know, underlying soils in, in, in different areas of the meadow garden as well. Uh, so there's some differences in soil chemistry. If you notice up at the very top, if you're looking uphill from that vantage point, that area is higher and drier. And if you walk up there, the plants are shorter. Um, 
in our, we, you can also see that we have a whole bunch of wet meadow down in the bottom. It's not quite a stream, it's just kind of wet down there. Um, and that, that area has a whole different plant community. Um, so it's really nice actually having all of this variety because then we have more, you know, more diversity of species. So yeah, we have differences in topography and uh, soil texture, a little bit of soil chemistry difference as well, and then the moisture gradients. Great for diversity. Jerry had a question about, uh, recently she read about uh, Cornell's climate change research garden. And she was inquiring, is Longwood, you know, working on the same kind of project or in conjunction with Cornell? I don't know a lot about that particular project. Um, we are very interested in um, thinking about the future. Um, and in, you know, we, we're uh, with the Meadow Garden, you know, Longwood is a place where many species uh, from around the world come to live. <laughs> and so in the, in the Meadow Garden, you know, we, we are open to species from, uh, you know, from North America, from, from Eastern North America that, that might be able to live here in the future. So uh, we do think about things like, you know, are there, um, you know, if we're, if we're looking at um, a species that has, a, has a, a big range north to south, we might look to you know, getting some plants from further south uh, in that range that are that where the, the those particular individuals are from further south populations to see how they do. You know, um, change is a you know it's a process. So um, you know you, you can't expect things that you know are from southern Alabama necessarily to be able to tolerate our winters at this point. You know, um, although they may, you know, we may need to have plants that can tolerate much hotter summers in the future. Um, so we're, you know, we're thinking about that and we're, we're taking some experimental approaches in our, uh, in our plant selection. Beautiful. Another question about how can someone help um, beyond like this, this webinar is a great way to educate oneself, but is there volunteering opportunities that you know of either at Longwood or other institutions? Um, to assist with meadow um, health and wellness? Well, we definitely have lots of volunteer opportunities at Longwood. If you're interested in joining, uh, joining the meadow gardening team, we have one. <laughs> uh, but there, you know, there are other, um, other organizations that do, um, you know, that, that do native plantings in more urban contexts. Um, and there, you know, we also, you know, we, Volunteers are part of everything we do at Longwood. So we, you know, we have a like a science, you know, a science team. We have our bloom team. Um, so there are lots of ways to get involved, um, as well as um, you know, establishing native plants in your in your home environment. And just to add, uh, to look at or review Longwood volunteer opportunities please take a look at our website. At the very bottom of the webpage, you'll see uh, the word volunteer. Click on that, and then you'll see all of the open volunteer positions that we have. So thank you for your interest. Uh, another question was, Eva had a question about relative costs. Is it really a lot of upfront costs to create a meadow, or is it really the maintenance that is quite costly? So how much it costs to install depends on how you go about doing it. <laughs> so, you know, plugs tend to be more expensive, um, but they give you more plant, you know, more, more fluffy, exuberant, uh, well-developed plants much quicker um, and save you the problem of trying to figure out what's intentional and what's not. Um, so and it depends on how you, you know, how, how big an area you choose. So there's upfront costs can vary quite a little bit, quite a bit. There are, um, their seed is much less expensive um, and can be a totally successful way to do it as well. Um, in terms of maintenance, um, you know, in general, this type of habitat is less expensive than other types of, you know, per, per unit area things you might do in a home landscape. Um, but, you know, it does require some vigilance. So it depends on whether you do that yourself or if you get some help. Um, and the, the gen in general, the inputs would be lower. In terms of you know, because you don't need to put gas in your lawnmower, or I guess you might need one. <laughs> but mowing a meadow takes a little bit more of a robust uh, mower, also. Doris asked a question about the wildlife in the meadow. 
other than birds and, and deer that you mentioned, what else have you seen out in our meadow? Oh my goodness, that's a that's a big question. We have lots of things growing, living in the meadow. Um, well, we have foxes and rabbits and voles and mice and you know all the things you might expect to to find in the meadow. Snakes, um, but not harmful ones. Um, <laughs> Tiny ones. Um, we have uh, an amazing array of, of insect life. Um, we have, um, you know, we have silk moths. We have, um, you know, all kinds of, of uh, butterflies and skippers and and moths and um, my goodness, beetles, beetles, so many beetles. Um, you know, there are more species of beetles than any other kind of animal. So, you know. <laughs> Um, yeah, all kinds of things. Um, opossums. Uh, yeah. My, my mind is sort of like drawing a blank because there are just a lot of them. Named quite a few. <laughs> <laughs> Next question is from Rosemary. Um, the slide with all of the flowering plants that you featured, are any of them deer resistant? And if so, which ones? Uh, the deer. Um, so Deer resistant is always a relative thing, right? It depends on how hungry the deer are in your neighborhood. Um, but uh, I would I would suggest um, I'm trying to think if the if the Lady Bird Johnson has a list for that. Uh, but there you can get lists of native plants that that are more deer resistant. Um, many many plants are reasonably well uh, chemically defended. Ferns ferns are really good for that. Um, in a, in a wet meadow context, those can be nice. Um, yeah, so I, I would say uh, it, it's relative, but, but there are good lists out there. We received a question from John about the amount of sunlight that is needed to create a, uh, a meadow. Could you share a little bit more about that? So you can, uh, you can kind of push into part shade. Um, uh, but in general, full sun is what most of the plants are going to want. Um, and full sun, you know, that's, uh, it doesn't have to be 12 hours a day because, you know, we don't get that all year long here, but <laughs> we're not at the equator. Um, but in general, um, in general, you'll find that more other stuff starts showing up where you have shade at the edge of a meadow. So, you know, we, we end up managing a lot of vines more, you know, near, near trees and that, in shrubs and that kind of thing, partly because the birds land there and disperse them and leave them in a little pile of fertilizer. So um, in general, you full sun is best. But if you choose species, you know, if you wanna go more sedgy, um, there are lots of, of sedge species um, and some rushes that, you know, if you've got a more a wet site or, you know, you can, you can grow a lot of different kinds of sedges in a little bit more shade. Wonderful. Mary had a question about living in a development and, um, and they do have quite a bit of open space. Are you aware or could you recommend a consultant or a landscaping company that actually um, works on meadow designs? There are many happily, um, you know, it, it, this is an increasing area of interest in the, in the field of landscape architecture. Um, and I have been uh, very pleased to watch that, you know, to sort of interact with that, with that world. Um, there's a, uh, an organization called New Directions in the American Landscape that Larry Weiner uh, leads that, uh, that a lot of, uh, a lot of firms that are sort of aligned in that direction participate in. Um, there's also um, the Ecological Landscaping Alliance, um, or I'm sorry, Ecological Landscape Alliance um, is more of a like a, a professional uh, a trade group that that contains, you know, that that attracts and and has many members that that are uh, that are firms that do that kind of work. So those might be two good places to look. Um, for for people in your area that that might be suitable. Wonderful. Nadine had a question about beehives. Do we have bees in the meadow? We do have some beehives. Um, they're not directly on the meadow. They're on another meadow, or not on the meadow garden. They're not. They're in another meadow. We have a lot of native bees in the in the meadow garden. So um, native bees tend to be more solitary. 
um, like, you know, like I was saying, they live in like hollow stems, they live um, in little holes in the ground, they live in um, old wood. Um, so uh, we have a lot of native bee diversity. We're actually, we've been working with a grad student um, at University of Delaware to, to start getting a, getting a handle on, on what all the species are that we have. Wonderful. Lee had a question about control, controlling invasive species uh, such as Japanese Stalingrad, as well as Japanese hops in a mm. uh, in heavily meadow area. Any suggestion? I like really long gloves for Japanese hops. <laughs> it's got horrible <laughs> prickles all over it. Um, sleeves, uh, long gloves, and it, it's not that bad to pull. <laughs> Um, we have some wonderful volunteers who help us, you know, and we have a and we have a team. Um, but you know, our our people to area ratio is actually um, not not huge, you know. Um, so it is possible to to manage these things. Um, I I really recommend uh, for invasive species management. Uh, you can look up individual species, state extension services, and Penn State in particular um, have some really wonderful uh, detailed. Um, resources that can help you figure out what the options are that you might want to use because um, people have different preferences for what what methods they want to use in their home. Julia commented that she really um, enjoyed seeing that chart of color by plantings by month. So Julia, you will be receiving this re recorded presentation so you will be able to see that um, that slide again and look at it a little bit closely. And we're coming up to, we'll do two more questions. In every season, including fall, a good time to visit Longwood Meadow Garden. So is your, is your favorite season to visit the fall or is there another time that you would recommend visiting the meadow? All the time. <laughs> Um, I would say, you know, it, each, each season is different. So in winter, I love the meadow because, you know, it's great to just get out in the sun when the sun comes out, you know, and walk in the sun and the texture of all the plants is just really beautiful. Um, I really like it after a snow. Um, the way that the snow falls on all that texture is just also really beautiful. And we have a bunch of winter berries down in the bottom in the, in the, in the um, sort of stream corridor down there that, that looks very nice. Um, the spring is maybe a little quieter than, you know, in the spring, I tend to go into the forest and look at the, the spring ephemeral wildflowers. Um, in, the, in the summer, like all summer, you know, I mean, it's just from beginning to end, there's something exciting and interesting. I mean, I, I walk in the meadow garden every week, um, several times, and uh, I'm just constantly uh, seeing something new to enjoy. So. I have a really hard time picking, but if you want floral shebang, um, this is the time of year right now. <laughs> um, starting and actually starting a little while ago, the um, it's kind of interesting. This year, the the Joe Pye weed was a little earlier. It often occurs at the same time with the you know, so you have like purples and the and the yellow goldenrods. So it was occurring with the early goldenrod this year, and, and um, not so much with some of the later ones. We have many species of goldenrods in the meadow. Um, and yeah, so I mean, I love that, that you know, rich overwhelm of, of color um, this time of year, especially, but all year, all year. All year. <laughs> Our last question is from Pam, and I think it's a great one about the spotted lanternfly. And she noticed that the population felt way down this year. Is that a result of something that Longwood and your team is doing, or is it just natural? I'm not sure what's going on. I'm not, you know, I mean, anecdotally, I've seen just wings, meaning that something probably ate the body. So maybe birds were figuring out how to eat them. Um, not sure at a, at a landscape, that's like a big landscape scale, you know, beyond the borders of Longwood kind of, um, kind of process and um, situation. So I'm not sure, but I don't know, maybe our IPM specialist knows something I don't know. Though. That's possible. Thank you, Leah. Thank you for sharing your passion with our members. Again, this recording and the resource document will be uh, emailed to all attendees. And of course, I would like to thank you, our members. Your support not only preserves our rich legacy, but also helps Longwood Gardens to continue 
can inspire generations to come. Thank you from all of us at Longwood. Have a great day.